Okay. Um, so just a couple of notes. Um, we had homework 11, which was cut uh, use of vert or uh, let's see. I get I get 10 and 11 mixed up. Sorry. 10 is the is the little cube. The plate. Okay. Yeah. So I graded that. Um, most of those were good. There are the errors were. Um, I think one of them wasn't deburred well enough, and several of them didn't have enough left on the width or the length in order to properly cut down to the to the um, final size. Um, one of them won't even be able to make it at all because it was cut right at the uh, exactly the right length. Some of them were cut to a width that was bigger than the final product, but not by much. And I'm not sure those will clean up perfectly. So you need to be a little careful how you cut. The worse you cut, the worse you cut at when, like in straight lines, the more you're going to have to leave. Because if this is your final piece, it's got to be able to fit in there. So if you make nice straight cuts, you can leave less material. But you really ought to be leaving 50 or 60 thousandths. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're threatening not being able to clean that up. So um, those were the errors there. And then for homework 12, which is clamping it down, most of those are OK. Um, a lot of you did. One of these actions, which is okay. If you've got three clamps, it'll hold it down. But you've left so much of the piece off on its own, unclamped. You, it doesn't look like it'll flap because it's a nice thick piece of aluminum. But it will when you put a tool on it and that tool starts grabbing into it. And those tools have a helix, which pulls the chips up as it's spinning. It's going to want to pull the plate up. And then the plate's going to want to jam back down because of these clamps. Eventually, as this pulls up, the clamps will take over and it'll slap back down. You'll get this fluttering vibration problem, which is bad for the tool, it's bad for your finish, it's bad for the motors on the machine. So, um, you know, try and distribute your clamps based on how you're going to cut. If you, even if you say you were going to cut over here, that's not good enough to hold it down. If you're going to cut over here, that's fine, but one of these clamps should be way out there, closer to the edge where you're going to where you're going to cut. So those that's the most common errors there. Any questions there? So that's that. Uh, I sent the STL files off to Kai over at the ITL. He says he's going to run them. Two of them weren't in STL format. We'll, we'll change them for you, but um, there's points off for that. And then, let's see. I graded homework seven last night. I believe it's seven. Yeah, seven. For the most part, that, those are really good. Um, the uh, vast majority of the points deducted were because the drawings were not complete. There wasn't enough information on the drawings uh, for me to get a good feel of uh, for scale or what, what's going on there. So make sure that you're annotating your drawings a little bit better than that. Uh, do right now is homework nine, which is one more part and one more drawing for your SolidWorks final project. Homeworks. 11 and 12, 12 already graded because you already turned it in, and 10 you already graded, it's already turned in, they're on the milling machine. But then 11 is that little cube. So make sure you turn that into this box up here and make sure your name's on it. Then uh, also collecting quiz three, which is the drill and tap quiz. I think, I think you want the 
papers folded up into the bag. Right. So fold up the papers into the bag with the with the actual parts, and uh, make sure your name is on it somewhere, and then uh, throw it into the box. Once you're all done with that, we'll split groups. Have the A group come with me. Please bring your group to us. Okay. Yeah, we're ready to split. Okay, let's um, finish up with uh, fastening, and then we're going to move on to solid cam. So let's continue with fastening. Besides screws and bolts, which we went over at length yesterday, there's other kinds of fastening. Uh, one of the most common is pins. <clears throat> this is called a roll pin, or sometimes it's called a spring pin. And what this is, is a piece of metal that's been rolled and it's been heat treated. So it's uh, got some spring memory into in it. So when you drill a hole, you're going to force this pin into there, and this pin started out bigger than the hole. So you have to actually force that pin in there, which compresses the spring compresses this, which acts as a spring, and it wants to spring back because of its temper, and it's pushing back into the hole. So these are really good for vibration type uh, applications because they don't want to come out. That spring tension will resist vibrations that try and get this thing going. Um, other types of pins, this is called a clevis pin. So that's where you see that on trailer applications quite a bit, where you put a pin in there and then you put another pin, which is called a cotter pin, in there to prevent it from pulling out axially along its axis. And that's, those are used to attach two things together very quickly. Happens a lot. Another type of clevis pin is like a quick release pin. It's got a little ball with a spring in it, so you can force that pin into the hole and the little ball will go up into the, uh, push the spring up and then when it gets through, the spring will snap back. Those are only good if you have axial loads that won't exceed the spring constant of that little spring. 
And then we've talked about dowel pins. Those are really good for either press fits or location fits. Questions about pins. There's more, there's lots more pins out there, but I'll show you some applications here. So here's an application where there's a roll pin. This is a gun, some sort of gun, and this is probably the um, where they put the little shoulder, shoulder sling. So they need to attach it to the barrel. And you can imagine if this is on a shoulder sling, somebody's walking along with this gun, and there's a lot of vibration because you're bouncing up and down. So they use the roll pin so that this thing uh, will resist those vibrations and not come loose. All right, the way you insert these pins is, well, first of all, you want to drill your hole with a drill bit that matches the pin hole. And this is not a precise hole because this, this pin has a lot of play in spring. So if it's a quarter inch roll pin or a quarter inch spring pin, you drill a quarter inch hole. And then you'll either use an arbor press to press that pin in, or you'll tap it in with a hammer and a punch. It, they typically have a bevel on the edge, on one edge, in order to start it into a hole. And you can help it if you chamfer the hole slightly. You can remove them, but you have to punch them out with a punch. So it's a semi-permanent um, uh, installation. You have, to, you have to have tools to get it out. So it's not something that you would use if you want to uh, have a lot of flexibility with assembling and disassembling quickly. Uh, dowel pins. So here's a knife, and it's got dowel pins pressed in to this piece of steel here to uh, restrict the motion of the two arms of this knife. So when this arm comes around, it stops. When it comes around this way, it stops. So this is a press fit. It's not welded. The hole was drilled several thousandths less. Then it was reamed with a precision drill bit, which is called a reamer. And then a dowel pin that is extremely accurate, but just a little bit bigger than that hole, was pressed in using an arbor press. Okay? Again, you, you, they stay in using friction because you forced that thing in there. You have to be careful about coefficients of thermal expansion. In this case, they probably use the same material so that no matter what the temperature variations, these two materials would expand and contract at the same rate, and you don't have that problem. You can remove these pins with a press, but your life cycle time is limited. You, you can't be pressing a pin into a material two and three or five and six and seven times because every time you force that in there, you're pushing material out of the way. So really, it's a one-time thing. You might get away with two, but it's supposed to be a permanent application. Dowel pins can be used for location. So they manufacture these dowel pins to very accurate tolerances, and they're extremely precise. So if you buy one, and you buy a hundred, and you buy a thousand, they're all going to be the same. They're extremely precise. So uh, I wanted to show you kind of the difference between a screw and a dowel pin. So if this is a screw, remember screws have a nominal diameter. It's about a quarter inch, whereas a dowel pin will be exactly a quarter inch down to the fourth decimal place. So this is what you'll see with the screw. So it'd be a little bit of slop if this was the same quarter inch hole and the dowel pin will fill that up. So you can use it to locate very accurately within thousandths of an inch. You'll find that useful in some uh, applications. So here's a clutch off of a car. And this is on a clutch, you, uh, the transmission um, has an input shaft and it has to go into this hole, and it has to be located pretty precisely. Uh, every time they pull that transmission out and put it back in, it's got to fit back in. So they use these alignment pins for this clutch. So when the, when the mechanic goes to put this on, he cannot screw it up. He can't get it off axis at all because of these pins. It will, it will stick, uh, it'll stick onto those pins. Now, that was a slip fit, not a press fit. The mechanic slips it onto the pins and then bolts it down with the, with the bolts. 
Okay. So that slip fit is typically a half a thousandth to a thousandth oversize, bigger than the pin. So you'll have very little play, but there'll be, there'll be this tiny little play down to the fourth decimal place. It's pretty good though. It's better than a bolt. A bolt will slop around usually as much as 15 thousandths, 10 or 15 thousandths. So 10 times what we're looking at here. Um, as I discussed a little bit yesterday, dowels can also be used to resist shear loads. So screws are terrible in shear because they have little stress concentrations down in here. Okay. The same size dowel has no stress concentration. It's a nice smooth surface. So um, you, you, you can put it in shear. So if you ever have to hold two pieces together, but you know there's going to be a shear load, you use the bolts to just keep them together like this so that they don't come apart this way. But you use a dowel pin in the middle to resist the shear load. So you put the two pieces together on the pins, and they're so precise within their holes, they're very, very close to their holes. Then when you go back to put the bolts through to keep the two pieces together, they will not be precise in their holes. They won't even probably be touching the holes. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll be out like this. But they won't be subjected to any of these shear loads because the pins are taking up those loads. So that's a pretty common thing to do. Don't put your bolts in shear as engineers. It's a bad deal. All right, let's go to washers. There's all kinds of washers. We've got flat washers, different types of lock washers. And the, what these are meant for is anti-vibration. Okay, it's similar to that spring pin. So um, use these in applications where you're going to have some vibration and you're worried about the fastener coming loose. Belleville washers, I'll talk about those later. And fender washers, those are where the hole is small, but the washer got bigger, so it's distributing the load over a, a wider area. Washers have all kinds of purposes. So the, the, the probably, well... I don't know if it's the biggest one, but one of them is they can distribute load. So you've got load across this head. You've got a little bit of slop in this hole. You want to distribute that load farther out into the material. A, a good example is here. If we put, this is in wood. So if we put the nut on here with no washer, that nut's probably going to dig into that wood as you tighten it down because there's not much surface area here and there in uh, between there, the head and the wood but you're going to get a lot of compressive force from a bolt. Okay. You get a quarter inch bolt. You can put probably a couple of thousand pounds of compression or tension on that bolt. Um, as, as an aside for engineers, let me write that down. I can show you in the machinist handbook how to calculate uh, tensile strength of screws and bolts. It's, it's extremely high. That's why we use them. But if you, uh, it's kind of a complicated formula because of all the surface area of all these threads. If you want a real quick and dirty way to just get a lower bound on your tensile strength, remember a thread has two diameters, a major diameter, and a minor diameter, okay? If you want to get the lower bound of your tensile strength, you could assume that this screw is just a rod with that minor diameter. So instead of being a screw, it's now a rod with a smaller diameter and then you can take the cross-sectional area of that round diameter and you can do your tensile analysis that way. Now that screw will be a lot stronger than that analysis that you're going to perform, but this would be a lower bound. So if this lower bound is acceptable to your tensile load, then this 
upper bound certainly will be. Okay? So, and this is a much easier calculation, right? Okay. Jewelry? Um, washers can provide an offset. So, let's say you put this through a piece of material and you need, uh, you have too many threads on the back side. Uh, you need this bolt to go back a little bit. You can put more washers in here and it'll, it'll push this bolt out this way. Um, they're almost always necessary when used with lock washers. So this lock washer, the nuts tend not to distribute the load all the way across that lock washer. So it's nice to put a flat washer in there to really distribute that load over that lock washer and compress that lock washer down. All right, about lock washers. So there's a couple of different kinds. They prevent vibrations that would spin the bolt out, okay? There's a couple of kinds. There's toothed washers. This is an internal tooth washer. They also have external tooth washers, which are um, look like little stars. The way these work is the little teeth are kind of up. So here's the, here's the main washer. The little teeth are kind of raised. And then when you flatten that down, the little teeth dig into the material. Okay, so th th these washers use friction because the teeth dug into the material. They use friction to resist the, resist the uh, vibrations. I like these ones better. These are called split ring and very similar to the roll pins uh, or, or the spring pins. They have been cut and bent and split and then heat treated that way so that they have memory. When you go and force them down flat, that spring tension constantly pushes against the two flat surfaces. So it's, it's a spring constant that's um, resisting your vibrations. Belleville washers are another kind of spring washer. They're just, they're cupped. And they're used in applications where you need a little bit of play up and down. Okay, the most common one I've seen is the washer that goes on your uh, valves on your car. So your valves go up and down, not very much, only about maybe a quarter inch, maybe less. But they do it millions and gazillions of times because they're doing it at thousands of RPMs, right? So they're just, they're doing this all the time. Well, they have to be bolted in. So they put a Belleville washer in there and then it allows it to spring down, spring up, spring down, spring up. I found this out the hard way because I uh, did a um, valve stem job on my wife's car one time and I put flat, I lost a washer, put a flat washer in there. And in about three minutes of operation, this bolt broke because that flat washer did not allow it to spring up and down. So it fatigued from vibration quickly and broke. So it had to have that Belleville washer to spring up and down. Rivets, you can put things together with rivets. The most common in aerospace is pop rivets. So uh, there's other kinds of rivets where they have a, uh, if you've seen building rivets, when, when I was a kid they had Bug Bunny and they used to have all these cartoons with riveters because they were building so much back in the 50s, they, everybody was a riveter. So they put building structural members together with rivets where they'd have a hole and a rivet that's much too big for that hole. They would heat that up to almost melting point and then they would force that rivet into that hole because it's bigger and then they'd peen over the back side. So, uh, and then when it cooled, it, it would help held it together. These are pop rivets, and they're mostly meant for sheet metal, which is why we kind of use them in uh, aeronautical applications, because we use a lot of thin sheets. You drill a hole that's the, the same diameter as the rivet, you stick the rivet down in here, and then you use a tool that pulls this steel pin up and malforms the rivet, kind of peens it over, and then, and then when you get a little too much pressure, this, this um, pin breaks. 
it breaks in uh, axial tension or intention and pops. That's what I call a pop rivet. It makes a sound. It breaks and pops. And then you're left with this piece right here, the rivet, and it holds the two pieces of material together. So those are pretty common. You can use retaining rings. They're all, all often referred to as snap rings. And the reason they are referred to as snap rings is you have to take a tool and stick it in these little holes, compress it, then put it into a groove, and then let go. And the spring tension in here snaps them into place. They have internal ones. This is meant for inside a bore. And they have external ones. That's meant for outside a shaft. I'll show you some better pictures. You ha they have to be put in with uh, special snap ring pliers. So here's, a, here's some examples. So this was an external. The, a groove was machined into this, this axle, and then the external was put in there. Um, look here. This is a bearing assembly. In order to keep the ball bearing in this housing, a little groove was machined in here, and a snap ring was installed. So it keeps the bearing from coming out in this direction. And here's a little, another picture of that same idea. They're pretty strong because in that, in that application, you've got a, let's say you've got the ball bearing here. And you've got a groove in your material. And then you've got this snap ring. In order to get this to come out, you would have to shear that snap ring material. So the snap ring material say that thick, you'd have to shear it right there. So you'd have to put quite a bit of load on that. Now in, these, in this bearing application, this particular bearing is a radial bearing. It's expecting radial loads this way, not axial loads this way. So the loads on that on that axis should be pretty small, so the retaining ring should be able to handle it. Then we have nuts. We have all kinds of different nuts. We have your standard hex nut. We have nylon locking nuts that have a little bit of nylon in there. When you turn the screw, it digs into the nylon. That's an anti-vibration device as well. Acorn nuts, they have a cap so you don't, that's not sharp. Couplings, or we call them standoffs. You'll, you'll be using those in your final project. And we've talked about captive fasteners like PEM nuts for sheet metal. And there's all different, there are more, way more kinds than this. Just want to show you a few. So nuts, they, a quarter 20 works with a quarter 20. You can't have a quarter 28 nut and a quarter 20 bolt. It won't work. Okay. Nylon nuts I talked about. You need to understand that this is a, a one-time use. So when you put the screw in here, it digs into the nylon. If you pull that back out and put the next screw in there, it's already been cut. So it won't, it won't have uh, those anti-vibration properties as well as it used to. So you should replace it if you remove them. Couplings, they join two screws together, or we use them commonly in aerospace to stack um, electronics boards, print PCBs you'll hear, uh, printed circuit boards. Uh, that's really common in aer aerospace applications, mechanical as well. So you use those couplings to stand those off. They come in all different kinds. They come in round, hex, square, all different lengths, different thread sizes. Um, they're pretty cool. And then I wanted to spend some time on helicoils or thread inserts because aerospace applications use these a lot. So these are called the trade name, the 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 like a, like Kleenex, the kind of the first company and the biggest company that's dealt with these is called helicoil. Um, so a lot of people just call them helicoils now, but what they really are is helical thread inserts. Okay. So this is what it looks like. It's got a little tang that's got a little cut in here so that when you're done installing it, you can break this tang off. And then the outer diameter is bigger than the inner diameter. These inner threads will be for whatever size you want. Let's say quarter 20, 10, 32, 8, 32, whatever. 
when you're finished, that screw will go into those threads. But these threads are bigger than that. Okay? We use them for a couple of things. You can use them to repair damaged threads. Let's say on your car, strip the thread out, you want to repair it, you can do that. In aerospace, we use it for different reasons. Most of the stuff we fly, we have to fly it, and weight costs money. So we tend to use very lightweight and malleable materials. Aluminum is a good, a good example. But in many cases, either with coefficients of thermal expansion or with uh, uh, because we want a stronger uh, tensile load on these tiny little uh, screws that we use, we want to re replace the aluminum thread with another material. Typically, these helicoils are stainless steel, but you can get them in all different kinds of materials. You can get them in phosphor, bronze, and all kinds of crazy materials. So we tend to use them for these softer materials, like putting into plastic, putting into aluminum. Show you how they work. Um, the helicoil hole is bigger than the original hole. You got to drill it bigger. So, you have to look up a special tap drill chart. So here's a, a helicoil tap drill chart. So 832, let's say, is a number 17 drill. Now, if you were to go look up a 832 on a regular tap drill chart, you'll see... It's a number 29, much smaller. Look at the close fit clearance hole is an 18. That's almost exactly the size of the, of the helicoil, number 17. So this is much bigger. So you have to be careful when you use helicoils. So you have to use a different chart. They also have metric helicoils. They're getting more common, um, especially with vehicles. So you'll see you'll find metric helicoils mostly in auto parts stores because we have a lot of foreign cars here and they use all metric so um, you know 15 years ago you couldn't you couldn't find a metric helicoil it's impossible now you can't but check the auto parts stores that's typically where they are because the threads on the helicoil are bigger than the threads that you want to have at the end they have special taps which are bigger and you have to be very careful because they still say 632 on them. So if you look at a 632 tap and, uh, and a 632 helicoil tap, and you're just holding them up in your hands, they'll look so similar, you might screw up and mess up which one is which. Okay. But if you try and jam this helicoil tap into a hole that was drilled for a standard tap, it'll be way too big, and you'll probably break the tap. The way you tell is this STI. Sometimes it'll say helicoil, but sometimes it'll say STI. That set stands for stainless thread insert. So read your taps carefully before you tap holes. Um, another thing to mention with taps is sometimes it's hard to tell between left hand and right hand. Again, if you read the tap, a left hand tap will have a little LH, left hand. Okay. Most of the helicoils are installed with a special tool. And the reason is this little drum here and this little threaded part here compresses that helicoil. And then you put it in the hole and spin it in. And when it leaves this drum, it snaps into the threads you made for the helicoil. And then the last step, once you've spun that in, is you need to break this tang off at that little pre-cut. Pre and you usually use a little tool. Make sure it's sticking a punch. Make sure it's sticking right on the tang. And then you smack it with a hammer. And it'll break.
Uh, just a couple of other notes, helicoils come in other materials like phosphor bronze is a common one for aerospace and they also come in a locking variety. The locking ones come um, coated with this purple paint so you don't uh, uh, mistake them. You want to remove this purple paint uh, typically before you install the helicoil. The locking ones have in the middle of their uh, geometry they have kind of a hexagonal shape so that when you turn the screw in here it kind of jams through this thread and that that jamming that spring tension from jamming it through there holds that in so it's another anti-vibration type device that's pretty much it for fastening any questions on fastening hopefully you guys have been exposed to some other methods of fastening. So when you go to start doing designs, you'll have some good ideas. All right, let's start with solid cam. Um, if you want to follow along, I believe OIT got solid cam installed on these computers. It's embedded within SolidWorks. So if you want to follow along, you can. Okay. Um, so some background first. You've seen the machines. We have manual milling machines, and they move in an X and a Y and a Z axis, and even a couple more axes. But that's how they move. Like I said, a CNC or an NC is a numerical control machine. So they've put DC motors on those axes with encoders and feedback loops. And, uh, and, and so you can program the machine to move the X, Y, and Z based on a computerized pattern of very small steps, very small X and Y linear steps. Just about every conventional machine tool controller out there uses a language called G-code. Okay, it was a language developed years and years and years ago when they were just developing CNCs. It's pretty much common across the entire world. And I'm going to show you some G-codes. These are codes that, this is a programming language, it's very, very simplified because these machines are pretty stupid. All they do is move in X, Y, and Z, okay? They've written some subroutines for these codes and that's this programming language. And it's pretty, as you can see, it's pretty simplified, okay? Each one of these codes is kind of like a subroutine in software and it can have parameters uh, behind it. So some common common codes are like you'll see G codes are typically G stands for kind of go. So go in this way. So G00 is go fast. G01 is go straight. G02 is go in an arc. Okay. Um, a lot of these higher codes are canned cycles. So, for example, if you want to drill a hole, you might want to just go down and up, drill all the way through. But you may have a real thick piece and a small drill bit, so you might want to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. That's a canned cycle, a drilling cycle. So you can just give it that G-code and it knows you want to go down, up, down, up, down, up, and then it says what parameters would you like to set for that down, up, down, up, down, up? Okay. There's also M codes. M codes typically stand for machine. So it does things for the machine, like turn the spindle on, go to this RPM, turn the coolant on, um, end the program, things like that. These are to, uh, stop, stop doing, stop moving. So those are typically machine codes. I want to see an example of a program. Here's an example. This is what G-code kind of looks like. Okay, this is, this is like uh, uh, 
the beginning of your program kind of sets some parameters. There, I wanted to show you this because there's other codes. You'll see T codes. What would you guess that stands for? This is a really dumb code. Close. Tool. So this is asking the machine to insert tool one. Okay. You'll have, you'll see X, Y, and, and Z, Zs. Those are obvious. Those are the axes. So in this case, it says G00. That means go really fast. G54 is a work coordinate system. We're going to talk about that. So it's saying go really fast, work in this coordinate system, and go to X0.314 and Y1.1093. Then it gives me an S code. What do you suppose that is? Speed, it's spindle speed. And then what, what do you suppose that 3500 is? RPM. So it says, okay, machine, turn the spindle on at 3,500 RPM. And then it keeps going. So here it says a G43, you could go look it up. It's basically setting a height for this tool. And it's saying go to Z5. Then go to Z2. Then do a, I believe this is a drilling operation. So it says drill at this XY point. Go to this Z depth, retract in steps of 0.1 inches, no PEC, Q would be the PEC. So since it's zero, there's no PEC. So this is going to drill in and drill out. What do you suppose F7 is? What would F stand for? Feed. So this is the feed speed. So what do you think 7 is? Inches per minute. So the spindle spinning 3,500, and it's going to feed at 7 inches a minute. It's going to go all the way in. It's going to go come all the way out. And then it's going to go to this point and do the same thing. Then this point, do the same thing. Then this point, do the same thing. And then G80 will cancel that can drilling cycle. Okay, so 98 is going to, or 83 is going to start the cycle. 80 is going to cancel the cycle. Yes? Um, for speed breaks and some rotation stuff, um, is there a way to define like, what, a, uh, what measuring system to use, like the metric versus material? Yes. It's in solid cam. Okay. And I'll show you. Now, the only problem is all our machines are English. Right. So you can do it in in inches per, or uh, millimeters per second and things like that. I, I can show you how to do that. So when you're programming this into a machine or a CNC kind of another, like there's no way to program it to do millimeters and just it's either in inches or zero. No, you can program it to do uh, metric, but you wouldn't want to give a machine that's expecting English units metric units. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you get machines that are in China, you better give it metric uh uh, feeds and speeds. Okay. You see what I mean? But if yeah. you if you do it here, you probably not. It depends on the the controller. So solid cam. Uh, I'll get into this more. Solid cam machining or uh, computer aided machining programs are meant to program any controller out there, any one. So you actually have to pick the controller that you're programming to. Oh, okay, that's, that's what I was talking about. Right? You have to. Yes, and I'll, I'm going to get into that. I'll show you. I just wanted to give you some background so that you understand what the machine is reading. This is the file that the machine is reading. Okay. Now, back in the day, and this includes me, we didn't have computer-aided machining programs. We had to write this code ourselves. Now, I don't know if you can imagine this, but if you make one little mistake here, you type a 4 instead of a 5, this machine's going to crash. It's going to do whatever you tell it to do in here. And this can get complicated and hard to understand. So, for example, 
look here, this, this is going to drill at x.314 and y1.1. Well, the next command is just go to y3.077. What does that mean happened with x? It stayed the same. So it was at this xy point, and then it moves to this y point. Well, that can get complicated, and you can, you can forget that if you're writing long lines of code. Okay? So somebody decided maybe we should make a, a, a software program that has a more graphical interface because this can get complicated. So that's what they did, and that's what all our computer-aided machining programs are now. They are an interface for us, a graphical interface for us, but once we're done programming, it's going to generate this code for the machine because this is all the machine understands. So I just wanted to make uh, show you, un uh, have you understand the fundamentals of what's going on here. Um, you also, you also need to know a little bit of G code because. If something's going wrong in a program, you need to be able to at least find it and edit this code. Okay? Or find it and go back to SolidCam and, and be able to edit the code. Know what know what uh, sol what parameter SolidCam is tweaking based on the G code that it output. So you need to know a little bit of this code. You have to be able to read it a little bit. It's kind of like it's kind of like if you were going to visit Paris, you just need to know a few words in French so that you can you know get some food or go to the bathroom you don't have to be fluent in french but you got to know a few words kind of kind of like what we're doing here okay Okay, so the computer-aided machining program, in this case, is SolidCam. There's a lot out there. Probably the biggest well-known one is MasterCam. We moved to SolidCam because in the past, uh, your computer-aided drafting software, which is SolidWorks here, was a separate program. You'd have to close this and open a computer-aided machining software package, completely different window, completely different program, and you would import a file and write toolpaths on it. SolidCam beat MasterCam to the punch with integrating the computer-aided machining interface with the computer-aided drafting interface. So now SolidCam is still a separate program, but it's running kind of like an add-on uh, in the SolidWorks environment. Since then, MasterCam has now done that, but they didn't get there first. So we decided to go with SolidCam, and we think it's a little easier to click around and understand for students. But they all basically work the same. All right, so in this case, you'll see the two tabs indicating that SolidCam is running and operating within the SolidWorks environment. There's one more interface. So SolidCam is the graphical interface for us. It is going to use a subprogram called a post processor, and that will take all of our graphical inputs and process them into G code, which we can then send to the machine. So it's called a post processor. Or, and so you'll, very often you'll hear machinists or manufacturing engineers saying we have to post it, post it over, that sort of thing. It's a post processor. You have to select the appropriate, and this goes to your question, the appropriate post processor for the machine controller you're using. So, for example... Let's open a file. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open just, just to show you. I'm going to open one of the files you're going to be working on. Let's see. How about top plate? Now, I have not written. I don't 
oh, the, my, my students, uh, when they built these parts, wrote a um, program for this. So this is not what I want to see. I want to, I want to start fresh. How about we got this gear file from a manufacturer. So that doesn't have a tool path on it. So I'm going to grab that. So let's pretend these holes weren't here and I had to drill them. I'm going to, I'm just showing you this because I want you to understand the post processor and how it relates to the machines. I'm going to go to solid cam, new milling file. So I'm working on a milling machine. Before we start anything, it's going to ask me for the post processor. So it's basically asking what machine are you going to be running on? And I need to speak that language. So all of these controllers are like different languages. They speak different languages. They're basically the same, but they're, they have little quirks and, and inconsistencies. So you have to pick the correct language. All right, I'll go into this a little bit later. But I want to show you the post processors. That's right here. So on, on one of our very first screens, it asks, what CNC machine am I working on? And look at all these different machines. So here's a Cincinnati machine and a Fadal and a Haas and Herco and Makino, Mazak, Morseki, you know, Toyota, all these different machines, and they all speak a different language. The, you are selecting, when you select here, you're selecting the post processor that will speak to that machine properly. Okay, so if I selected a, mach, a machine that only understood metric units, SolidCam would use that information and all the defaults within your uh, option selections would come up in those units. We have two for aerospace. So I want you to pay attention. We have two different kinds of controllers, two different languages. Wolf Creek, the machine in the corner, is an Accurite machine, and the post processor is Accurite CU Aerospace. The other two big bed mill machines are both, they're A Trump machines, which is, a, which is a Korean machine, but the controller is not. It's Centroid, which is an American controller. So to talk to the controller, you need to use Centroid. Okay, now you're going to need these two based on what uh, machine you're working on, and we have them for you on D2L. So if you look under content, and look under SolidWorks, SolidCam, SolidCam shop post processors, you will have the Accurite and the Centroid Aerospace Post Processor here. Now, if you want to see what a post processor looks like, let's, uh, and you'll need all of them. So this Centroid, Centroid CU Aerospace, Centroid CU Aerospace, all the Centroid ones, you'll need to drop them into the post processor directory within your environment. Where is that? Let's go find that. So on my machine, let's go to Program Files. We're gonna have to find that directory. I didn't. I didn't pre-look at it. Here it is. Under pr Regular Program Files, Solid Cam. Let's see, is it utilities? No. Solid cam. Okay, let's go to the program and find the directory. It's been so long since I've done this, I forgot where it is. <laughs> Um, 
maybe I might have to. So I close that and go to solid cam settings. See if I can find fault. So default CNC controller. Here it is. And so it's in in on my machine it's under users users public documents solid cam 13 gpp tool so let's go look there c drive users public documents solid cam 13 GPP tool. So this is the directory that you'll want to drop in all those centroid files or if you're using the accurate machine all those accurate files. All right. So you'll have to do that on these machines. It's not done for you. Or if you got solid cam at home, you'll have to do that on your personal copy of SolidCam. Otherwise, it won't have the post processor that can speak the language that our machines speak. Okay? If you use the shop computers, that's already been done for you. Okay. So, again, under SolidCam settings, you'll find that. Um, I think we're over. So, let's call it break time. Is that right? <laughs>